Well, good morning, good morning, good morning, everyone. <clears throat> Hopefully you can hear me. All of a sudden, I just <clears throat> developed a frog in my throat. That's always fun. <laughs> well, <clears throat> unfortunately, with the way Facebook now makes this live producer, whatever they talk about it, doesn't really tell me when you guys are joining in and, and who's watching, which I really don't like. I really liked the old uh, setup and it told you who can who was coming on, when they were coming on, because um, I like to interact with you all. But hopefully you have your cup of coffee or tea or soda or water and uh, have a notebook, pen and paper handy, uh, highlighters, rulers, whatever other forms of uh, writing instruments as we continue our study in and through church history. Uh, looking forward to this. Uh, it's a very interesting subject. As I mentioned last week, I love history. And what's even more interesting is seeing in the study of her church history how an absence of church history has affected um, our ecclesiology, our eschatology, and our hermeneutics throughout the ages. Dr. Howard yesterday was continuing his, uh, last couple of days, continuing his presentation on hermeneutics and exegesis. And it just go, it, what, it goes to show that an absence of understanding of church history then mitigates or negates your ability to properly teach because you can often fall into the realm of errors that people before you have gone in. So church history is is part of the interwoven tapestry of the other ologies within the Christian faith. Hermitology, anthropology, uh, Christology, um, all the other, you know, we could go on saying ology for the rest of the next half hour. Okay, don't you don't have sound, Teresa? Um, so far on my end, it's looking pretty good. Uh, anyone else having a hard time hearing me? Checking one, two. Yeah, it's coming through fine on my end. Checking one, two. Can you hear me now? Can you hear me now? Uh, I don't have a phone. You know, here we go. Can you hear me now? Okay. All right, Teresa. Good. I'm glad you can hear me. All right. Yeah. And we see this abundantly true as Dr. Howard's been talking about origin and his allegorical method of interpretation, which we'll be talking about next week and looking at some of the quote unquote early church fathers. Oh, good. Hi, Norman and Tab and Mrs. H and Teresa and Dr. Howard. Glad you guys are with us as we continue our journey through church history. <clears throat> Interesting, fun, fun quiz for you guys. And I will actually have some quizzes in our group uh, later. Is which two early church fathers knew both Hebrew and Greek? Which two early church fathers knew Hebrew and Greek? Anyone want to take a crack at it? I guess the better question is, is only two? And you would be correct, too. <laughs> No one, no one's taking a crack at it. Well, one of them was already listed. Origen was one of the only church fathers to know both Hebrew and Greek. But what was the other early church father to? <laughs> yeah, right tab Jeopardy music. Who was the other church father? <clears throat> 
I'll give you guys a hint. He translated the Old and New Testaments from Greek into Latin. See, I like this kind of Jeopardy Bible trivia. Every time, actually, on Jeopardy, when, when a Bible topic comes up, I it's great because I, I love it, and I usually cream the that whole <clears throat> row of questions. Um, I think I've only been stumped once because I just couldn't remember. So the timer is up. The second person is actually Jerome. So Origen and Jerome were two of the early church fathers that knew both Hebrew and Greek. So we're going to see this as we start moving along in our church history timeline. We're going to see because of a lack of understanding of Hebrew, there is a skew towards rejecting and misunderstanding the Hebrew roots of the Christian faith. Uh, hence, we start seeing, even with origin, uh, an anti-Semitic view when it comes from when it comes to the Old Covenant. That's why I believe that it has its roots in from origin on, very early in the church. Um, this concept of replacement theology, and that comes very early because of a lack of understanding from some of the early church fathers that were. Um, Hellenistic or uh, Gentiles misunderstanding the Hebrew Old Testament and the covenants towards God's people. And it continues to this day. We have entire streams of theology that's based upon a bad assumption or misunderstanding centuries ago. This is why church history is important, because if we actually really look at scriptures, okay, Mrs. Howard won't forget origin and Jerome. It's it's going to come up in a in a test. <laughs> that we quickly forget the the real roots and history is often skewed towards the victor. Whoever wins gets to write the history. And so for many of the history that we have on the early church fathers, it's those that survived or their documents that were able to survive until now some of the early church fathers we have no extant copies of their writings we only know what is talked about them in and through other either historians or early church fathers like papias nada we've got zip as far as documentation as papias but we have papias quoted by other church fathers during the same period so it, you have to wonder, are those quotes correct? Are they accurate? Um, do they actually represent his views or his quotes? These, these are some of the things that we're going to be talking about in church history, especially as we start lurking at the early church fathers. But before that, for the first section of early church history, from the ascension of Christ all the way till... Um, the Edict of Toleration in 311, uh, we're going to see some of the, the largest persecution of the church in those first three centuries. The persecuted church is what this is often described of and talked about. Um, according to tradition, each of the apostles met a violent death. We've talked about this a little bit last, last week. Excuse me. And that the church is inaugurated by Christ during his earthly ministry and continued on past his ascension. And each and every one of his apostles, minus John, met an, a very violent and untimely death. Uh, some of these are recorded and some of them are merely church history and or legend but simon peter the first notable leader of the church was executed at rome it was said that he was crucified upside down um that may or may not have happened but it at least we do know that he did 
uh, die a violent death. James, son of Zebedee, preached in Judea. He was beheaded by Herod Antipas about 44 AD. That we do have both internal and external sources to show his ex execution and uh, <laughs> um, his end. John labored in Jerusalem and then from Ephesus among the churches of Asia Minor. He was banished to the Isle of Patmos, liberated, and died a natural death at Ephesus. So here we see, as we're going through the study of uh, Book of Revelation during the week each week, uh, John's tie to both Jerusalem and Ephesus is very strong. And there is a claim that John's body is still in Ephesus. Um, whether or not that's the actual sarcophagus or the ossuary bone box of John is up for debate. But we do know that John was very concerned about the those in Ephesus, as we see in his letters, 1st, 2nd, 3rd John, as well as his letter from Christ to the church in Ephesus, Revelation chapter 2. Andrew, once a disciple of John the Baptist, preached in Scythia, Scythia, uh, Greece and Asia Minor. He died by crucifixion, according to church history. Philip preached in Phrygia and died a martyr's death at Heropolis. Bartholomew became a missionary in Armenia, and he was flayed to death, according to church history. Ouch, that is a, certainly a way to go. Thomas labored in Parthia, Persia, and India. He suffered martyrdom near Madras, at Mount St. Thomas, supposedly. Once again, a lot of these are tradition and are not widely attested to as far as by historians or uh, parchment or papyri that record them. So they're, once again, left up to church history. Matthew ministered in Ethiopia and was martyred there. James the Lesser preached in Palestine and Egypt where he was finally crucified. Jude preached in Assyria and Persia where he is martyred. Um, and Simon the Zealot was crucified. And last but not least, Judas Iscariot hanged himself following the betrayal of Christ. Here we have the twelve and each of their untimely and gruesome ends. I love the modern prosperity gospel. Come to Christ and you'll be fat, healthy, happy, and wise. How did that work out for the disciples? Which of, which of them lived to be fat, healthy, happy? None. Even John, living a long life, was still persecuted. He was... Uh, attempts on his life were made often, and he was an exile for many years. And yet, modern Christians try and put this spin, especially quote unquote preachers, as Dr. Howard was talking about this week, of trying to take the message that the early Christians were willing to die for and then say that you can demand. To be fat, healthy, happy, and wise. Nah, no. Hey, David, Andrea, and Norman. Good to see you guys. It, it just doesn't follow. Especially as we start to look at the next three centuries of persecution in the church. By the government and those around them. We come up to one of the Roman leaders, Nero and should be a name which is abundantly familiar to most that remember their world history. Um, we're not going to look into every Roman leader um, from the time of Christ's ascension until the Edict of Toleration in 311. Um, that, is a, that would be an entire study in and of itself of 300 years of emperors and persecution. But... In AD 64, during the reign of Nero, a fire began on June 18th, and the fire burned brightly for six days and seven nights. Um, there, there is a common phrase uh, that Nero watched as Rome burned. 
And that's speculation and myth to, for the most part. But a lot of pressure came upon Nero because of this rumor that he was the one to start the fires in Rome. And instead, he blames the Christians. And the Christians were blamed, and all of a sudden, then this huge uproar, not only from the government, but then also from their friends, their neighbors, the whole community started wholesale persecuting Christians with flayings, beatings, crucifixions, burning alive, just started a horrible period um, within the first century of persecution of Christians. This is where some of the earliest church fathers start showing up in their not only defense of Christianity, but in how each of them suffered a martyr's death. This week we're going to be looking primarily about their their martyrdom and their actions during persecution. And next week picking up their literary work, some of which are uh, continue with us to this day, and how they defended the faith, their apologetic so we commonly describe the first era from about 90 AD, the, the death roundabout of John, to uh, the first half of the second century as what's called the apostolic fathers, those that would have um, communicated or been direct uh, disciples of the apostles. With those, they predominantly just edified the church during a time of heavy persecution. Um, they didn't really have the time to write a systematic theology or to write large volumes on commentary on a book of the Bible. Predominantly, they went from house to house encouraging the brothers and the sisters despite the persecution continued teaching and preaching uh, the gospel news to everyone and anyone. And then we get the apologists, apologia, uh, making a defense for the faith. When there was a period of lighter persecution during the end of the second century, there was a little bit more toleration for dialogue and discussion and debate about the beliefs of Christianity versus Judaism or the pagan religions. Um, they also defended the church against Roman persecution. During this period, uh, second half of the second century, we see a lot of um, letters being written to whoever was Caesar, uh, defending the Christian position and why it should be um, allowed in in the empire and why it is not um, necessarily something that should be persecuted we have the polemicists um, start at the end of the second century into the third century from where we start to see faulty theology really pick up in the church uh, we start seeing people like marcion and seeing people like um, the early Gnostics, which had already started in John's time, but really kick up in the latter second century into the third century, in which the polemicists led the church against internal heresy. Uh, such people as Arius um, pop up and need to be dealt with during this time. The theologians, uh, 225 to 460, we see that during the 70 years of relative peace within the Roman Empire uh, and the Edict of Toleration in 311 allowed the theologians, the, the pastor theologians, to sit and to write their theologies, to write about the deity of Christ, to, to write about uh, the canon of Scripture, for instance. We see that during this period of time, especially post the edict of toleration we see some work going into the canon of scripture um, specifically the new testament what books should and should not be included um, and we're going to look at that quite a bit in detail about the different lists that were around starting in the second century on
They attempted to harmonize Christianity with popular philosophy, though, unfortunately. Many of the theologians were very steeped in, in Greek philosophy and with the, the pagan religions of the time. And so we start to see from this point onwards, we start to see a movement towards monasticism in hiding in caves or, or in some sort of Christian building or monastery and not to evangelize, but to then, you know, spend lots of time reading and contemplating. That's where we start seeing uh, body tattoos and or um, self-deprecation uh, to attain some type of otherworldly super Christian um, attunement, almost like a, a state of nirvana. And, and I think is the influence of a dualistic worldview of an overemphasis on the spiritual rather than, than the physical. And this led to the, cra I call them just the crazy desert church fathers. We start to then see someone like Ignatius. Um, his birth and death is approximately 67. So he was alive. He was born during the time in which some of the apostles were still alive and died very shortly after John. He is martyred by Trajan by throwing, being thrown to the beasts, um, according to both Roman history and church history, and at about 107 A.D., He's quoted as saying, may the beasts, wild beasts be eager to rush upon me. If they are, be unwilling, I will compel them. Come, crowds of wild beasts, come, tearing and mangling, racking of bone and hacking of limbs. Come, cruel tortures of the devil, only let me attain unto Christ. The early church fathers, as they met their deaths, however it may be, going to the beast, crucified, burning alive, each of them accepted persecution each of them embraced that they must suffer for christ's namesake um, and we're going to be looking at some of christ's words give me a moment oh that's some yummy coffee if you guys ever get a chance to try pete's coffee do so um <laughs> they embraced it they understood that to follow Christ is to be persecuted, to be outcast, to possibly face death. And that the Lord promised that when you are set before kings and, and princes, that the Spirit will give you the words to say. And that is the case with each of these early church leaders, early church fathers. Each of them made a brave and courageous stand for the gospel before the church uh, before the government leaders and were martyred they gave their testimony martyria as we looked at in revelation chapter one and yes dave i totally agree with you it is coming here that's why we're looking at this the way we are most church history books will glorify the early church fathers and only flippantly or very shortly talk about their deaths. I think it should be the other way around. Yes, they did great work for the kingdom in some of their writings and apologetics, but the example for the church should be not in their ability to write theology, but is in their how they lived. Is in their day to day, they went about ministering to the people of God and then faced their martyrdom and their death bravely, that they accepted that fact, that they knew to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord, and that God has, it, this is a part of his plan and his purpose. That if persecution and or martyrdom comes in our lives, we have to realize that it's not the, the devil per se, but God orchestrating things for his glory. That each of these early church fathers gave a great defense of the faith before their martyrdom. 
just as we see Stephen, the first martyr, and Acts, that tradition, if you want to call it that, continues in the early church fathers. Justin Martyr um, he lived, was born right about 180 and lived to 165. He wrote two apologies, apologia in the Greek, to the emperor Antonius Pius and to his adopted son, Marcus Aurelius. So for you movie buffs out there, what modern movie about the Roman Empire stars Marcus Aurelius? He also wrote a dialogue to Trifo the Jew in which he, Justin contended that Jesus was the Messiah. Pause there for a moment before we get to his statement at his death. Once again, this is where, even though Justin Martyr is only just what I would call a second generation Christian, he is, he is just slightly after the apostles died and he's learning from those that had learn from the apostles themselves. He's a second or third generation Christian. And we know already by this time, the Gentile Christians misunderstood the Old Testament because very few people knew Hebrew. Yes, there was the Septuagint or Septuagint version of the Old Testament into Greek, translated roughly about two to three hundred years before Christ. But there was wide misunderstanding about the history, traditions, and practice of the Jews, even by the beginning of the second century. So we see that in his dialogue with Trifo the Jew. We see Justin Martyr misunderstand um, covenantal issues and he does a good job in presenting Christ as the Messiah but it could have been better if there would have been a better understanding of the Jewish context the Jewish covenant and the the Old Testament I totally agree Dr. Howard as we do today we, we have zero excuse for misunderstanding god has given us his word in our language that we can understand and or if you want to spend some time you can learn hebrew and koine greek and be able to read uh, all of the different papyri and manuscripts that we have today there's no excuse for misunderstanding it's only laziness and or disinterest on our end that causes us to have these misunderstandings See, we can, in some ways, go back now that hindsight's 2020 and see Justin Martyr's dialogue with Trifo and understand his anachronisms, understand his misunderstandings, and go, you know what, we're not going to continue to do that. Also, just as we've been examining origin in Dr. Howard's class, in that understanding where the allegorical interpretation has come up and this misunderstanding of the process of prophecy, of the interpretation and understanding of prophecy. We can look back now on origin because of our knowledge of Hebrew and Greek and the process of a translation and go back and go, now we know why origin was wrong why origin was as uh, dr white puts it a wide-eyed lunatic heretic um and i would totally agree yeah yeah you're right dave uh, the apostate church but justin martyr also faced his death quite bravely we deserve nothing more than to suffer for our Lord Jesus Christ, for this gives us salvation and joyfulness before his dreadful judgment seat. I find this phrase very, very interesting theologically. We see that he, that his martyrdom, martyrian, he states that for it gives him salvation, but salvation is in and through Christ and Christ alone. Once again, you already see deviation from 
apostolic teaching about the nature of salvation, um, we do see very early on during the persecution some writings equating the persecution with uh, a, the process of earning salvation. We see an immediate turn into a synergistic work in which early Christians believed that somehow their martyrdom was going to help them attain heaven. And I personally believe, as we're going to look at this later with the development of doctrine in church history, that by about the fourth century, this was deeply embedded within the church's practice that the Rome, what would become the Roman Catholic Church picked up on the synergism of some of the early church and made it doctrine. But that this is my understanding, looking back on history, hindsight's 2020, and seeing a development over time in this area of doctrine that is pretty clear to see here in Justin Martyr. And also, uh, I think also a misunderstanding by Justin Martyr about the judgment seat. Um, for Christians, the judgment seat, the bema seat of Christ is about rewards, not salvation. Salvation has been accomplished. Each time we read about it from the point of the crucifixion on, it is a past tense um, event. It, it It is done. Salvation has been completed. It is finished to tell us I. So for the early martyrs to then see that their martyrdom earned them extra special merit um, to be able to get into heaven at the judgment seat, I think is a misunderstanding of eschatology and their position in Christ. Now, does a lot of grace need to be given for the, those in the early in the church that did not maybe have the time or the resources to have a fully fleshed out systematic theology? Yeah. Do I think Justin martyrs in heaven? Yes. But we can clearly see God is allowing us to look back at history and see how errors in the church begin and how to help prevent them ourselves. Um, Justin Martyr was martyred by Marcus Aurelius, and the answer to the question about what modern movie is Gladiator. We see Marcus Aurelius as the primary leader during the time, the era in which the movie Gladiator takes place. So this should be something that is familiar, this era of time familiar to us because of Hollywood. Polycarp, uh, one of my favorites actually, uh, lived, was born about 70 AD, died in 156. Um, he would have been alive um, during the time that John was still alive as he is in Ephesus. Probably the best known of the early martyrs and the early church fathers is Polycarp. M much of his writings is, has survived till today. And with all of these early church fathers, I will post a link in both the Committed 100 and in the church history page, that you can find their works translated from Greek or Latin into English for free. Um, 98%, I would say, of the early church fathers' works has been translated into English and is widely available. Um, a lot of their great works in their apologetics and in their encouraging of the church is available for free now um, because of technology and the internet. And you don't have to go buy the, the giant, you know, 50-volume early church father set, which I now ha I have digitally now. I used to have a, a paperback or not paper, hardback copy, um, but I mean it looks impressive on the bookshelf, but it's a lot easier to find what you need digitally. <laughs> um, as Bishop of Smyrna, um, this is where even at the beginning of the second century, the title of bishop is used more than pastor. 
even though the the word is used can be descriptive of both this is where we start to see a hierarchy assembling in the church bishops and then deacons and then you start seeing the the supremacy of the the church in rome beginning of the second century and on into the third century he was a disciple of john so he has first-hand accounts of the crucifixion he has first-hand accounts of all of the disciples and their untime not untimely but their gruesome deaths um getting direct didactic teaching from john in his messages to the church polycarp emphasized faith in christ and the necessity of working out faith in daily life i think polycarp understood rightly the harmonization between uh, paul and james in the quote-unquote modern controversy of works and faith um it's a but it's apparent in his work um and that was his encouragement to the church is showing your faith in and through what you do when the hour of ex his execution came the proconsul offered polycarp a way to escape yep yeah, I hear you, Dave. Bishop Dave. Yeah, it doesn't quite sound right. I know. I know. But that's, that's our Western post-Reformation bias towards those titles. I mean, yes, technically, Bishop is, could be a correct um, interpretation from Greek into Latin of that phrase. But just so as can the title of pastor or elder um, can. And one of these days I will go through um, two different studies. One on uh, church leadership, elders and deacons, and which Dr. Howard already has gone through in his study of uh, 1 and 2 Timothy and Titus but to specifically dig into the original languages and to see how um, we have abused them. Polycarp was given a way out. One of the pro councils, in other words, one of the, the lawyers, gave Polycarp a way out. But what is not said here in the textbooks is that the way in which he would escape is to much like everyone at that time once a year you were required to go to an altar to, to whoever the caesar was and to put a pinch of incense in in the altar and say kaiser curias caesar is lord and so that is something that many of the early church could not do nor should they have done is told to him that he should revile Christ, make the offering to Caesar, and I will release you, said the proconsul. But Polycarp replied, Eighty and six years I have served him, speaking of the Lord, and he has never done me wrong. How can I blaspheme my king who has saved me? I am a Christian. Yeah, this is certainly one of those great rallying cries. Uh, much like we see later in the Reformation, the, you know, as Martin Luther said, you know, I'm captive to the word of God. Here I stand and I can do no other. That's a famous rallying cry for Christians. But some of these early rallying cries by Polycarp, Ignatius, and others are not as well known. And I think they should be. When you look in Fox's, Books of Mar Fox's Book of Martyrs, for instance, you see many of these quotations, and they were actually great comfort to those that suffered uh, post the, the Roman period for the word. Some of these things are, in fact, great comfort to those in Asia. In fact, um, I read an email recently from China 
about some of the Christians that are under heavy persecution there are connecting their persecution with the persecution of the early churches we're looking at here. And they're, they're, they're identifying with the early church and in their testimony for the faith. We'll also be looking at next week uh, some of Polycarp's writings and his development of theology during his lifetime. Though he is now famous for his thoughtful meditations, probably one of his larger works that still remains. The Emperor Marcus Aurelius proved to be a terrible foe of Christianity. It was his decree that the property of Christians should be given to those who accused them. As a result of this policy, ruthless individuals came forward with false accusations against the saints. Christians were sought out, brought to trial, convicted, and condemned, and their property was confiscated and given away. So we see that very early on, someone found a loophole in blaming Christians. Just like in China, it is very profitable if you know of an underground church or a church building to tell the local authorities. There is an unsaid bounty on Christians in China. It can be very, very lucrative for those. Or some Christians in China are being um, extorted for money so that they are not exposed to the government. And yet this is exactly what's happening during the time of Polycarp. Marcus Aurelius makes this edict and people are profiting off, or, uh, off of the persecution of Christians unjustly. Um, under even the rules in which Marcus Aurelius put into place, there was, you could worship any God you wanted as long as it didn't interfere with your abilities as a citizen. The accusations against the saints by those that wanted their possessions was that they had become wild-eyed, crazy people in rejecting their loyalty to the nation and their their patriotism and you know it's funny is this is exactly the position in which we're in i could easily see a similar situation happen in america where if as it continues to become more and more secular that if you do not say for instance donald trump is king or whoever the president is at the time in which it could be very easily easy for your neighbors to rat you out and saying, Oh, they're not being patriotic enough. Um, and something like these edicts by Aurelius be put into place. Now, do I think we're going to see them in our lifetimes? I don't know. Um, I'm, I'm not, going to even try and attempt to predict the future because I am not a prophet and I do not pretend to be one. But it could it could happen in our lifetime or children's lifetime or, you know, if the Lord tarries another thousand years. But this type of ratting out, of exposing your neighbors and your friends is happening other parts of the world. We've just been blessed to not see it here in America. We also see a slight peace before persecution picks back up. With the death of Marcus Aurelius in 180, a general period of peace came to the church, which lasted about 70 years. So about one generation, one lifetime of peace in the midst of huge persecution by Nero and Aurelius and others in the early centuries of the church. There's one exception to this piece as persecution broke out during the reign of Septimus uh, for about 11 years. Great violence broke out against Christians, specifically in Egypt, in the, in the northern part near um, Alexandria. We see great violence towards Christians Christians 
that was fueled by the government and by the leadership. Um, along with many others who were put to death before the faith was Origen, and I wouldn't necessarily put him in this category. Uh, many history books look way too favorably on Origen, and, and yet they kind of dismiss his allegorical interpretation and his misunderstanding of the scriptures. But he was one of the most, the famous, I would say, of the Alexandrian writers. Those, you know, we hear of the Library of Alexandria is, is a common phrase in which we know that it had burned and much of the knowledge of the time had been lost. And that's why we, we guard against the burning of said or the accidental fires or de destruction of that type of knowledge. But I think overall, as we've been looking at prophecy and the al allegorical interpretation of origin, uh, predominantly the history books, I think, have this nostalgic romanticism with origin that is misplaced. And on we get to origin. He lived 185 to about 254. He encouraged an allegorical interpretation of the scriptures. A, a, he had this dichotomy. He would say in which, where the, the scriptures are plain, that they're plain and to be taken that way. But specifically when it came to prophecy, this allegorical interpretation came forth. Simply stated, this method of understanding the scriptures holds that to the literal meaning of the Bible conceals a deeper meaning, sublayers. It's an it's an onion that can only be perceived by the mature believer. He taught that this concealing of the truth by God under the guise of common words was designed to prevent the pearls from being cast before the uninterested and unbelieving, quote-unquote, swine. And yet, that is entirely opposite to the way in which at least Dr. Howard and myself and some others uh, view the scriptures. Literal interpretation of the scriptures. And that we believe in the the verbal plenary inspiration of the scriptures. So in the same way that the, the words are, are given and written and are passed down is the same way that we should receive them. Literal, historical, and grammatical interpretation, which, by the way, was the predominant view up until origin. And then origin skews everything towards what becomes the desert church fathers, which becomes the primary view of the reformers over a, a millennia later in which the, the effect of origins teaching carries on till today. If you were to go in and look at a, oh, I hate to say Christian bookstore because half the books in the Christian bookstore are heresy anyways. Um, one of the, one of the most dangerous places for a modern Christian is a Christian bookstore. Because of things like origin, and I have to blame some of the reformers, in their misunderstanding and interpretation of scripture leads us to some of the craziness that we have today. Um, Post-millennial views, amillennial preterist views of theology, specifically prophecy, have led to some really strange things coming up. Also, this allegorical interpretation has influenced not only the conservative end of Christian Christianity, but the liberal end as well. Um, Origen's presentation of an allegorical interpretation is the beginning of putting yourself into the Bible. Is to then, well, read read that passage, but but put every time it mentions Christ, put you in there instead of Christ. We hear this all the time on, on that blasphemous network, as Dr. Howard puts it, TBN, or all over quote-unquote Christian radio or Christian teaching. 
of putting ourselves into the Bible, that started with Origen in his allegorical interpretation of this taking the context and totally throwing it away and then placing, oh, it's got to have a much deeper meaning for you, that, that you become the focus rather than the text. And it's something that we have to realize starts with origin and how that those tendrils come and filter in and through church history and affect even the reformers. They, they affect uh, many of the early church fathers post-origin and many of the actual cults that come that are dealt with Arius and others were influenced by the teaching of origin as many of which you could say are direct descendants theologically to origin. So, you know, if, you know, I'm going to leave that up to the Lord, but if the origins in heaven, um, we each of us deserves a at least one good smack at origin when we get there. Then once we see after the 70 years of peace, after Aurelius dies, we see the most severe persecution, at least in recorded history of Christians, um, coming under Diocletian. Beginning in February of 303, three edicts of persecution were, in, were issued in quick succession. Within one year's time, there's three edicts by uh, the ruler of the empire. The first one in February was raise the Christian church at Nicomedia. Um, we see that this was specifically targeted um, because it was a rather large gathering of Christians. Um, they had amassed a, a bit of wealth in I, what we could now call icons or statues. Um, very interesting that also at this time we, we also read of the beginning of Marian worship right around the third century and just before the and, and great what Roman Catholics would call veneration of Mary even by this time, uh, very early on. And we're going to track, this is one thing that we are going to do within this church history is number one to track origins influences, but also to, to track the influences of paganism into the veneration and worship of Mary that leads into the more modern Roman Catholic uh, doctrines of perpetual virginity of Mary, the uh, sainthood of Mary, her ascension, her being the queen of heaven, we're going to see some of those influences very early on here in church history. Also, the next day, the edict came against Christians, in which it was op open season for Christians, period. Um, if they would not make the pinch of in incense to um, Caesar, they were exposed. Well, that's my goal, Dr. Howard, is to expose it all. Um, I'm really kind of sick of church history being this romanticized. I don't, I don't know what to call it. Many of the church history textbooks in which we have and the books written about church history have this glorified view of many of the church fathers in which ignores looking at them not only in their own time and their own perspective, but based upon what was their influence throughout the centuries, such as Origen and others. This edict against Christians was open season. This, in 303, was probably the year of the most deaths of Christians within the empire at any other point. And it, in 303, it expanded beyond the known Roman Empire. Yeah, basically, you're right, Tab. The more modern, or even, actually, church history books of the last, I would say, five centuries, 
have had this romanticized view of not only the reformers, but of the early church fathers, even though a lot of them, quote unquote, early church fathers were a bunch of flame and heretics. And then what's interesting is that there was a slight amnesty given in October of that same year. So within eight months, you have a heavy persecution of Christians and that they could be freed by giving an offering to the gods. What's interesting of note is historians also say that somehow, yes, Diocletian led the largest persecution of Christians, and yet that led to even some of his uh, centurions and proconsuls um, ignoring some of the edicts against Christians. We see that during this period, especially after October of that year, that many Christians that were presented in front of an idol to Caesar, even though they had not pinched the, the offering of incense, even though they had not said the words Kaiser Curias, um, were counted as that they had. And this was one of those double-edged things. Yes, they were spared the, the wrath of the government. But because it was counted as they had made the sacrifice, some of those Christians were viewed as heretics by their brothers and sisters in Christ. Even though they may not have said the words or actually did the offering, because it, they were counted as doing so, some of those Christians were ostracized from their brothers and sisters in Christ, because they were believed to be traitors, to, to be apostatized from the faith. And so it, it created this unease within the church about who was and was not really a believer. We're going to see a similar situation come up in just the about another century past this. In October 20th of that year, the general amnesty came up and Eusebius and his Martyrs of Palestine, a great recording of just the a swath of persecution that came to the church, records the case of one man who, after being brought to an altar, had his hand seized and made to complete a sacrificial offering. In other words, he wasn't com complicit in the offering. The clergyman was told that his act of sacrifice had been recognized and was summarily dismissed. Others were told that they had sacrificed even when they had done nothing. I think it was, this is Chris's view here, looking back on history. I think some of this was done on purpose to cause dissension in the church because this clergyman of some sort is recorded. Um, and if I remember correctly in, in Eusebius's recording of it, it was much like we would call a monk today. Was He was bound and he was forced to give this offering to purposely put him at odds to, to make him doubt his position, to make others doubt his position within the church. And, and I could clearly see something like this happening, um, especially during the time in which John records during the tribulation period, that it is done on purpose to cause dissension in the ranks, so to speak. In February or March 304, we see the fourth edict ordered that all persons, men, women, and children to gather in a public space and offer a collective sacrifice. If they refused, they were to be executed. So we see this great up and down in the, the reign of Diocletian. That these four edicts, three of them in the period of one year and the next one coming a couple of years later, that we see this great martyrdom of believers and this great dissension in the ranks because of what was done in and through the offerings. 
But then we get to the ultimate, you know, fight or flight moment is that everybody's put together kind of like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And whether or not they will would worship or bow down to the idol. And many, many Christians, men, women, and children were put to death because of this edict. They were put into a common space. They used many of the amphitheaters in which Rome had created for their um, plays and their um, debates to gather people together to collectively offer an offering to Caesar. And if a Christian refused, they were put to death. Then we come lastly for today to the grace of Galerius. When the emperor of the East, Galerius, became ill, he suffered excruciating torment. In his hours of agony, Galerius had the opportunity to consider the pain of the Christians. In the will of the Lord, Galerius manifested a measure of grace. From his deathbed, he issued in the year 311 an edict granting Christians permission to worship freely. He even invited prayers for his own soul. By receiving more freedom to worship and by manifesting a willingness to pray for one's enemies. Um, there's a lot of debate about whether or not Galerius became a Christian during this period of time. But we know this as the Edict of Toleration in 311. It took some time for the entire empire to not only receive this edict, but also to enforce it. So we see even in... Oh, probably the two years post this, post 311, we see persecution still continuing in different provinces of the Roman Empire until it it is adopted and enforced uh, within the empire. From 311 until we get to Constantine is, is a relative time of peace in which we see some of the bigger works being done in the areas of theology, but also at the same time, we see the influence of paganism and the adoption of certain practices by the Christian church from their neighbors, um, which was John talked about in his letters to the seven churches, in which the big question is, we study book of Revelation, which one of those churches is still here today? So Galerius gives this edict of toleration, which gives rise to um, someone like Constantine rising and making Christianity the official, quote unquote, religion of the empire. Oh, well, sorry to hear that, Teresa. Sorry for your loss. And we'll be praying for you and, and the family. Hopefully they knew the Lord. With that, we come to the end of our second session, second lesson in church history. This is just a small overview of the, the first three centuries of persecution. There's many other periods during this time in which Christians suffered, uh, but not as much as we see, especially with Nero and Diocletian. This next week, we're going to be looking specifically at the theological developments within the first three centuries of the Christian church and how certain errors come to the forefront, specifically Arius and, and the Gnostics, um, but also errors such as origin. This, I'm hoping that you guys are seeing how interconnected Church history is with the development of doctrine, with the development of apologetics. Um, and as we start looking at Ignatius and Polycarp, the development of Christology and anthropology and all the other ologies are beginning to develop during this period of time. Obviously, not as much as we would necessarily like it to, but we have to realize that under a period of persecution, persecution, 
that there's not really a whole lot of time to just sit and contemplate uh, theology. They, they've got to work to, to make a living. There, there's no scholar's benefits of having a, a position at a university in which you are paid to do research and to publish your findings. And the, that type of scholasticism didn't exist. Uh, for another, oh, for basically eight, nine hundred years after this. So we see that they, the theology that they did work on and they did try and produce was um, high, high Christology, uh, defending the deity of Christ and the Trinity in the first three centuries. Um, once we get to the end of the, the first three centuries, though, Already the barn door had been opened to things like Marian worship and into whether or not Christ was divine, his nature, his substance, which led to the first ecumenical council in 325. Um, these are the considerations that we're going to start looking at next week as we study church history. Thank you all for being here. Um, Glad that everybody was able to, to join us and to uh, glean something from church history. And I, I find it very useful in looking at theology and tracking um, how we've gotten our systematic theologies today and how we, as Dr. Howard's been teaching on prophecy, how do we know that we're interpreting prophecy correctly? what has been the the modus operandi of the past and how do we know that we're properly doing it well we can look at its development in church history there is a stream of historical theology which look at which does look at those trends but for the sake of this class i'm kind of melding the two with that you guys have a blessed weekend um hopefully everybody will be on and listening to nightlight tonight um, this has been Daylight, and uh, it's been great to be with you guys. See you all later.